Uh, good morning. Um, glad to have you here with us today. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19 and um, looking at, uh, this is actually the last uh, parable in the city, uh, sorry, in the city, in the series, and we're going to be looking at, it's called um, Occupy Till I Come in Luke chapter 19. And right before we get started, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the, the message of the Sunday School Hour. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the series that we're going through and um, how productive it was just in my life and studying it, Lord. And as well, I do pray that it's a blessing to the teens who've been listening and as well as now the adults who've been tuning in. Father, I do pray that you do bless this last one. Help us to listen well to it and apply its truth to our life. And uh, we thank you uh, for this day that you gave us and help us to uh, be glad in it and uh, to serve you like we can and should. And we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we see here uh, in Luke chapter 19, uh, it does just start off with um, Christ getting ready to give a, a another parable uh, to his disciples. And before we get to verse 11, just back up a little bit and see uh, the context of what's going on. Christ, uh, heading through Jericho, uh, runs into, or really walks underneath Zacchaeus, who's up in a tree, and calls him to come down and start speaking with him. And um, obviously gets invited to his house, and, and if you remember the, the children's song there, he, he decides to follow the Lord, and, and Zacchaeus gets saved. And, and so this is what's happening, do we see here, and then he says here in verse 9, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then we come here to verse 11, which kicks off where we'll see this parable. He says, and, he, and as they heard these things, now remember, his disciples are with them traveling through here. They're heading to Jerusalem, which is then where you'll see when they hear the triumphal entry later on in this, this chapter, actually. And um, But here, before he even gets there, he has this parable to give them. And, he, and as they as they heard these things, which Christ said to Zacchaeus, he added and spake a parable. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Now we're going to read the rest of this all the way to verse 27. So just follow along. And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said to him, Well, done, well, well thou good servant, because thou hast done faithful in a very little, and thou, thou authority over ten, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art, art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then, thou, wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So we see here um, in the parable, and the reason why it was given is, as you can see in verse 11, and as they heard, what his disciples heard previously, and it says that, uh, he gave this, this he gave this parable because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So here Christ is with his disciples approximately three and a half years, and here they're heading to Jerusalem and believing that the kingdom is going to be set up. It's going to happen. 
And that's where we see the point one here, the misunderstanding of the kingdom, is that they believed it was going to happen immediately. Because previously it says, as they heard these things, uh, that Christ say to to Zach and Zacchaeus, he says, This day, verse 9, his salvation comes to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So they had a misunderstanding here. They believing that, that as you look at this, that Christ was referring obviously to Zacchaeus and coming to save his soul, but the disciples obviously believing something different, meaning that, hey, the kingdom's going to be set up. We're on our way to Jerusalem. This is the Passover that's happening. This would be a great time to get rid of the Roman rule. And he's saying that he's come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, what was lost? Well, they lost their country to Rome. And so he's come to do these things. And this is what they were thinking, that the kingdom here is going to be set up. Now, as the ancient historian Josephus says, that, that during this Passover time, about 2 million Jews would return um, home to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So there's a lot of people um, coming in here, and that's when you see the triumphal entry, all these people. And then later on, when, 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 when Christ is resurrected, and further on, when, the, when, when Peter preaches at Pentecost, all these people of different tongues hear what's being said. Well, there are, there are, there are several people from other parts of the, the known world at that time, and probably the Jews that were spread out, and knew different, knowing different languages, coming back for the Passover, where they preached to. And so this was happening at this time. So in the disciples' mindset, all these Jewish people are coming back to Jerusalem. What better time to set up the kingdom? They're thinking, hey, this is what's going to happen. Even further on, when Christ meets in the, the Last Supper, he's teaching the disciples to be servants and understand these things. Several of them still thought, even Peter, to the, to the very end of the Garden of Gethsemane, hey, the kingdom is going to be set up. Even with this parable and explaining, no, Verse 13 says, occupy till I come. And so he's trying to get them to understand that through all these other past parables we've been looking at, the lost souls is what he's talking about and putting emphasis on, not on the kingdom being set up. And so this is where the disciples are at. They clearly thought, hey, this is over. This is going to end. But realize God, uh, well, Christ is God. And this is what the disciples were thinking. And so then he answered their thoughts here with this parable and explaining to them that, no, we need to occupy till I come. Because remember, Christ's purpose wasn't, I'm going to set the kingdom right immediately. But Christ is king. But do remember, the kingdom on earth has not been set up yet. Christ's purpose was to come and to die for sinners and then be buried and rise from the dead so he could conquer sin and death. That was the purpose that Christ came for, so that then you can see that one day, Philippians chapter 2, 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name, uh, a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That was the purpose, the one day that will happen, but here the disciples were believing the kingdom's coming right now. But we have to understand, and if you've studied the history of the world and studied the Bible, the kingdom has not been set up yet on earth. So as a believer, unfortunately, there's a, there's, there's a group of people who believe they can better the world and better things to, to prepare for the kingdom. But you have to understand, Christ will come when the Father gives him the, the authority to do so. No one knows when that time will be. And so do always remember, like it says here, occupy till I come. That means to stay busy serving the Lord till he comes, not to um, listen to these, um, for me, for this word, psychopaths who believe they know when the end time comes, and then all of a sudden they'll say, uh, this is when the Lord will come, and they hoard up into a building. No, that's not what Christ says. He says you need to stay busy, not to stay hidden. In fact, it's what the disciples did shortly after he died, was they stayed together in one room. But no, the purpose was to be um, blessed and to be sanctified and sent out to spread the gospel, not to stay hidden in a room. So as believers, we're not supposed to stay hidden. We're supposed to occupy. We're supposed to stay busy. And so we need to understand that only Christ can bring the kingdom. Just as Christ is the only way to heaven, uh, he's the only one that can then bring the kingdom. Not us. Not, not, not us trying to be good and try to help the world be better. That's not going to happen. As long as there's uh, sinful people on this planet, uh, it's not going to get better. And so as we see here, this misunderstanding that the disciples had of the kingdom, believing, hey, Christ is going to bring the kingdom when we get to Jerusalem. And because they were thinking these things, 
and to give he gave this parable to help them to understand uh, that no, that's not what the king, that's not what's going to happen. The lost that Christ was referring to when he was talking to Zacchaeus was, "I'm come to seek and to save the lost, those souls." He gave parables of the lost sheep, uh, the lost son, the lost coin, and then explained how the Pharisees were focused on on the things of this world, and the, no, the focus is on the lost, not setting up the kingdom. And so then we get here to the next point, and not just the misunderstanding of the kingdom, but the meaning of this parable. Um, and some people, you look at it and you see how it, it, it's similar to a different parable, but this is not talking about the parable of the talents and how those servants use their talents uh, for their master. This is, this is a different parable. This, this one actually talks about uh, the citizens that hated him, his servants whom he gave the, the pounds to. Now here it says he gave one a piece, so this isn't referring to the parable of the talents this is referring to being busy with the gospel of the lord because remember christ came to die uh, for our sins so this parable that he gives here says a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return so do remember christ uh when you, when you read the book of hebrews and you talk about and it reads about the, the old testament uh, saints how they're looking for the a, a certain country uh heaven is what they're looking forward to. So here is the nobleman Christ going to a far country to then return someday with the kingdom. And that's what he's referring to here. And talking about who his servants are. And mentions here, he called his ten servants, delivered on them ten pounds, and said, Occupy till I come. Stay busy till I come. We are his servants, and we have this responsibility. This, the, this money is representing our responsibility to share the gospel with this world. And to continue on. Uh, working for him and occupying, staying busy, following him, doing what we're supposed to do as believers serving the Lord, to occupy till he comes. And obviously here it gives us another example of what the world represents, but his citizens. So here's the nobleman, here's his, his, the area he rules, but his citizens hated him, sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And that's just like the world. The world rejects to be under God's authority, rejects to be under Christ's authority. And as a believer, we need to realize that we are under his authority. And as these servants realize they are under his authority, and we are as well are under this authority, and we need to allow Christ to rule in our life. But the, the citizens of this country, they're not his servants. They're not his children. They're not following him. They hate him. The world hates him and will not serve him. Psalm 2, 1 talks about the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing. And you almost can see that as there's just this hate here. And you can uh, just turn on the news or listen to the radio or pick up a newspaper and just, or blog or whatever on social media and see the world just does not love God. They hate him and they don't want to follow him. They don't want to go under his rule. And obviously his kingdom has not yet been set up here on earth. But remember, he goes to a far country to receive that and to come back. So the citizens, they don't want to have Christ reign over them. But we as servants, we have to occupy and stay busy serving the Lord and not just and not stop what we're doing uh, because of hardships or trials or even blessings or good times. We can't stop doing that. We need to stay busy serving God and serving him. And you may say, when do we, when do we stop? Well, till death or like it shows here, these ten servants... They didn't die when he came back. In other words, the rapture. We need to stay busy serving the Lord until, until God calls us home through death or through the rapture. Amen. We need to stay busy and follow him and do what we're supposed to do as believers and sharing the gospel and, and following him and doing what we're supposed to do. And so we see here that the disciples were wanting the kingdom to set up. Christ explained, no, you need to occupy. You need to stay busy. And that's what occupy is, not just standing still. Occupy means to be busy about things and serving the Lord. And then we find here next that we see the meaning of the parable is about being occupied with the Lord, what he gave us to do, which is share the gospel. And then the meeting with the king. Obviously, uh, he will return. And when he does return, he brings the kingdom. And we, as we see here the rapture, he will begin to rule. And he will set up his thousand-year reign in the future here. And he will rule the iron fist, and he'll, he'll at the end of that time, uh, give the world that last opportunity to choose him or, or not. And like it says here, uh, he talks about the citizens here, how, how they, they hated him. So do understand that here we find in verse 27, it says, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. 
So we do have to understand that they will be judged one day, the lost, those who reject the king, those who reject God. And they will be judged, and it's called the great white throne judgment. And sometimes I always, I don't see the coincidences here in the Bible more. There's not coincidence here that's called the great white throne. Uh, the throne is where the king stays. The throne is, is where the king is at. And so here at the great white throne judgment, those who reject him as king and say, we will not serve you, will be judged at the great white throne, where he is king, where he is the supreme judge. And he will judge them saying, hey, you had the opportunity. I sent my son to die for your sins. So all you have to do is accept that gift and receive him and have eternal life. But you rejected that. And you have the great white throne judgment there. And then you'll find as well that we're, we're, they're not the only ones uh, facing the judgment. Because when he comes first, I mean, we see the judgment here. That When you read the book of Revelation, the great white throne judgment is the last judgment. Here, the last verse of the parable, that is the judgment for these enemies, those who rejected him. But we do find that in if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> In verse 10, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So do you see that as well, that when the, the nobleman, the king, returns and talks to his servants, they were judged for what they did with that pound. They were judged for what they did with the gospel. So do realize God wants to save, and he's there to save, but we have a mission as servants that are left here, occupying till he comes, staying busy with the work of the gospel till he comes. We're busy about those things. Here we have one servant who has the one pound and stayed busy and produced ten. So that day when he gets judged, uh, the Lord will say to him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And you can see uh, how he's going to be rewarded. And then the servant who, who didn't do anything, that was given to him. His reward was given to him. And another servant who, who had five pounds gained from there. And as you can see, that's what we're supposed to do, is not to just stay holding our pound and not giving the gospel out, but to be a witness, be a, be a testimony for the Lord, occupying, staying busy till he comes. And, and you have to witness you have to make a conversation you have to make a friendship with the world as we looked earlier about um about the unjust steward and and using what's here on this earth to be a witness and to reach people for remember their eternal habitations to have treasures laid up in heaven and that's our goal as a a servant of the lord is to have that done and we see these two servants here the scripture mentions he is at the ten servants but only talks about the three who he's speaking to but we know they were judged as well but the one servant that we do look at here is the one who who obviously didn't do anything and it says here in verse 20 and another came saying lord behold here's my here is thy pound which i have kept laid up in a napkin he didn't do anything with it he stored it now this word napkin interesting enough it's 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 Two, two uses can be you, or is used, I should say, in the scripture. One is you put it over a person who is dead. Uh, when Christ was buried, talked about the napkin over his face. The other use is, is you use it to wipe sweat off your brow during hard work. The servant is not dead, so obviously he doesn't need the napkin to put over himself being dead. So obviously, he's busy working, but he's not occupying. He's busy doing things on earth. But he's not busy giving the gospel. You know, when, when we ever have the opportunity again to go to work, or go to school, or go out in public, go to the bank, go to the store, are you hiding the gospel like this servant is? He has his napkin. He's hiding the fact that he's a believer. He's hiding the fact that he's, that he's saved, that he's going to be at the, the judgment seat of Christ. But he's going to face the judgment here, not with reward, because he didn't do anything with the gospel. He just kept it hidden and didn't tell anybody about it. Where you have the other two servants who had the gospel, gospel, they did occupy. They stayed busy serving. But here's this one servant, he says, I put it in the napkin and hid it and would not share the gospel. And maybe it's because he knew the Lord was austere. He knew he was hard. And that's where we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 
As it says here, back to verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Looking at verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Verse 11 here doesn't mean we put the terror of the Lord on people to be saved. It's saying that we know the terror of the Lord, so that's why we go out and be a witness. Because he's not a, a horrible God, he's a magnificent, awesome God. But we need to understand that he is a just God. And that those friends, those family members, those people that we see that don't know the gospel, share it with them. Take it out of the napkin. I'm not sure what your napkin is and what you, why you're hiding the gospel, whether it's pride or opportunity. Or I'm a part of a book club, and if I share the gospel there, I'm going to get kicked out. I can't do this. God doesn't put a limitation on where we need to stop giving the gospel. The Apostle Paul will walk into the synagogue and give the gospel, or be thrown in prison and still give the gospel, or even face King Agrippa and give the gospel. We need to give the gospel and share it with people, no matter what limitations or statutes man put upon us, we still need to share the gospel and share it and get it out. So the question would be, are you staying busy for the Lord? Are you occupying still he comes? Until, until he comes. And that's what's important, is we need to stay busy with the Lord's work. What are you doing with the pound? And like I said earlier, what's your napkin? He's hiding his napkin and what you wipe your face off when you're sweating and busy, being busy, but not doing what he's supposed to. We don't know when Christ is going to come back. We have no idea when that is. Um, if, you're, if you're naive and ignorant to this world right now and what the scripture says, you can see that it's that you can see how it's setting up the Antichrist. Uh, because this world is looking for solutions and answers right now to a horrible thing, and they can't find it. And if it takes one person to stand up and have the solution, the world will probably follow that person. And that's probably going to be the Antichrist. Whether it's about this or some other event that's going throughout history, that's where they're going to follow. And so you can see these events setting themselves up for the end times. But guess what? We still don't know when it is. And remember, God only delays Christ's coming because he wants to see more saved. So that's why it's so important for us to occupy and to continue to be, to shed the, to be spreading the light and spreading the gospel. And so I just challenge you to continue occupying, to continue staying busy for the Lord and serving him and sharing the gospel and not hiding that. Not covering it up and not sharing it because of some opportunity or gain that you're looking for. You need to be a Christian first. And then whatever the, wherever the Lord takes you, then follow that. But the Christian first and follow the Lord. So I do challenge you to see that. And this parable, very fitting to be the last one. We need to occupy. We need to stay busy. And remember, a lot of the parables were about you know, seeking the lost and, and realizing his kingdom and what it was for. And let's pray and hope that you have a blessed Blessed week. Father in heaven, do thank you for this day. We thank you for your word so much, Lord. And we thank you for these parables and how, how you set them up. And, and so we can see even in the context of what you're talking about, Lord, and that we don't have to be ignorant to what it's even saying. Lord, we know that here you're telling us to be busy about your word and to be busy about the gospel. Lord, help us to share it like we're supposed to, even in the hard times, even in the trying times, Lord. And, and Lord, this isn't going to last forever, even in the good times again. Help us to always remember to share your word and to get your gospel out, Father. And as well, Lord, if there's anyone who's listening and they're one of the, the citizens here that hate you, they're one of the citizens here that won't accept you, Father, I do pray they'll come to you because when the great white throne judgment starts, um, there's, no other, there's no chance after that. I do pray that you work in their hearts and let them realize that you came and died for them and to forgive their sins. Lord, help them to accept you and believe you. Father, I do pray for those Christians who are hiding your word and they're not spreading the gospel. They have, they have a napkin that they're hiding it in. Lord, I do pray that you work in them and help them to take the gospel out and to share it and to use it. And Lord, you, you gave us all power to do so. You, you gave us that power. And I do pray you help us to stand strong for you in these times. Thank you for your goodness to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.